Welcome to the hidden corners where truth and terror collide. Discover a realm where the lines between the living and the supernatural blur as you embark on a journey to the paranormal and visit the mysterious hidden corners of your mind. This is book three of the Wolfman Chronicles, chapter six, The Grizzly Encounter. We're still in Montana. Exhaustion weighs heavy upon my weary frame. A relentless burden saps the strength from my limbs and clouds my thoughts with the fog of fatigue. Every step becomes a struggle. Every movement, just a laborious effort. I'm weary of the world, weary of the endless cycle of survival and predation that defines my existence. The ever-present threat of danger lurking around every corner. It wears upon me like a heavy cloak, dragging me down into the depths of despair. I long for respite, for a moment of peace amidst the chaos of the world. But such moments are fleeting. Elusive as the shifting shadows that dance upon the forest floor. And yet, there is a fierce determination that burns within me. A flame of resilience that refuses to be extinguished by the trials of life I now face. The 5 a.m. alarm clock was ringing. Dakota opened one eye and fumbled for the snooze button. Damn, why had he opened that bottle of Jim Beam last night? His head felt like it was going to just explode. Just a few more minutes sleep, he told himself. Just a few more minutes. It rang again. He felt a wave of nausea and realized he really needed to pee. Punching the off button on the alarm, he stood and felt the dizziness take over. Stumbling over beer cans littering the floor, he made it to the bathroom, barely able to hold himself upright. Leaning heavily against the wall and missing the toilet by a good four inches. He knew he had an eight o'clock briefing that morning with his supervisor and his job was on the line already. He stumbled to the kitchen, poured himself a a big gym, a concoction of one part gym beam and two parts monster energy drink. He rationalized that the whiskey would cut through the static clouding in his brain and, and the energy drink would point him in the right direction towards work. It's kind of like a compass finding true north. Instead, he found himself leaning over the toilet as waves of nausea and dizziness washed over him as he puked up whatever was left of his stomach lining. He'd be late for work again. The morning light was filtering through the trees as Sheriff Buck Brady entered Hungry Horse, only minutes from the Glacier National Park boundary. He had stopped at Bob's General Store for gas and coffee and dozed a couple hours in his truck, waiting for the park entrance to open. Now he was rested and ready to cross into the scenic park territory. In the days prior to leaving Big Sky, Buck had purchased a new phone in Bozeman and booked a cabin near the border of Canada under his real name, Chase Whitmore, and now he made sure he used that credit card when he bought his gas and supplies. He would enter the park boundary under his real name as well, drive to his cabin, and wait for his buddy to arrive. Jim, Cowboy Clark, led tourists on horseback tours between Glacier and Waterton Parks and north through the Canescas. Rich tourists could see where many movies and television series were filmed, such as The Revenant and Hell on Wheels, Inception, and the Born Legacy were all filmed there. His outfitter would carry all the supplies for the five or ten day trip. The park is open year round, but the horseback tours normally didn't start operating until about May. And this winter had been a mild one, and there was very little snow on the ground. It would be an early spring and an easy crossing. Buck Brady had plenty of bribe money to buy his way into the Canadian wilderness by horseback with no border checks required. Cowboy Jim was more than happy to comply with his wishes. Buck's new phone buzzed. Only one person had this new number, Cowboy Jim. He answered the call. 
Hey, buddy, are we still on for tomorrow? Everything's arranged, but I've got a court date I have to be at. Thursday's the earliest I can get away. I'll be there by nine at the latest. We can load up your bags and hit the trail. One of my men will drive your truck over and meet us up in Alberta once, once we've cleared the border. And I'm going to want half payment up front. You think that's going to be a problem? Buck sighed. Ah, uh, no problem at all. Just get me and my belongings across that border with no questions asked, and you'll get the rest of your money, and I'll double it if you can get here before Thursday. God, I wish I could, but if I don't show up for my court date, they'll throw my ass in jail, Cowboy Jim replied. Buck pushed the end call button and sighed. Guess I'll do some sightseeing, he said to himself. Put the truck in drive and pulled out of the parking lot. Now, Brandon drove into town with Miguel to pick up supplies. For a town with a population of just over 3,000, Big Sky had a good selection of guns and ammo stores. Everyone in town knew Brandon, and ever since the murders at the Moore Ranch, everyone had been on edge. It did not seem the least bit unusual for Brandon to buy more guns and ammunition than most people would ever need. People in Montana believed in being well-armed. Now, Lynn's making you a big pot roast and a couple of apple pies. We should pick up whatever other food you might need out there, though. Maybe some bacon and some eggs, a gallon of milk at least. Lynn and I will be at her sister's for a couple of weeks, and you two are free to use our place as much as you want. I know Jack wants to be out at his ranch, but it might be safer for you to stay at ours, Brandon explained. Thank you, Brandon, Miguel replied, but we're expecting a big confrontation and we'd feel better if that didn't happen at your place. Well, I understand, Brandon replied. He looked down at his hands on the steering wheel, then back at Miguel. There's something that's been worrying me, Miguel. Jack just doesn't seem, well, normal. I mean, it'd be expected with all the crap that's happened at the ranch and with the sheriff and all that, but there's something else. Jack seems uh, kind of, I don't know, depressed beyond all this. He waved his hands as if to encompass all the town, the ranch, the situation. Is he okay? Miguel breathed in deeply, then answered, No, nah, he's not okay. It's not anything serious like his health or anything like that. He's just, well, he's heartbroken. He fell hard for a woman in Russia, and she lied to him. It was circumstantial, and she may have been justified, but he won't accept that. I know it's weighing heavily on him. Well, hey, Miguel, thanks for telling me. I knew there was something Jack was holding back from us. Miguel sat in the passenger seat, deep in thought. Jack wears his emotions like an open book, but he has more to hide than just his heartache. I'm sure these two, as good as friends as they are, have no idea who Jack really is. Brandon, who's this woman Jack used to date here in town? He mentioned she was a widow. She'd go out occasionally, have dinner and such. And Is she still around? Maybe single? Perhaps meeting up with her will get this Russian woman off his mind, Miguel asked. Well, Brandon laughed. Oh, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. I'm sure she'd be happy to see old Jack again. She's a lonely woman. A little off, if you know what I mean. People around her call her Carla the crazy cat lady. She must have had a dozen cats at her house. She just kind of went off the deep end a few years back, about the same time Jack left town. Well, we all felt sorry for her after her husband died, but Jack was better than most. He'd go over and fix her broken appliances or help her round up stray horses when her fence was busted. He must have mended that fence a dozen times. She'd go into town and get liquored up at the bar and then drive right through the gate, forgetting to get out and open it up. So she'd wake up next morning and call Jack to help her find her horses. Brandon laughed again. Jack was always too nice a guy to say no. Hmm. Sounds like more trouble than it's worth, Miguel laughed. Yeah, I'd say so. If Jack wants to see her, let's let him make that decision. Now at Brandon's ranch, Lynn and Jack were sitting in the kitchen table drinking coffee. How long you two been married, asked Jack. Lynn laughed. Long enough to finish each other's sentences. Hell, we don't even need to speak half the time. We always seem to know what the other one's thinking. It's been a good marriage. We wanted to have kids, 
but it just never seemed to happen. That's the only thing that's really missing from our lives. But by the time we talked about adoption, we already felt like we were too old to be good parents. Parenting is a young person's game. Jack smiled. I suppose so. And these days, kids ain't taught the same as when we grew up. You know, with ranch chores and learning how to raise animals and grow food and hunt. It's a different world we're living in now. Don't you know it, Lynn agreed. How about you? Why'd you never get married? Well, Jack shrugged his shoulders. Just never found the right one, I guess, or, or I was too stupid to recognize it at the time. Jack, I'm worried about you. Lynn reached across the table and took his hand. Brandon and I are both worried about you. Well, thanks, Lynn. I'll, I'll just, I'll be fine. I just have to sort this mess out. I, I feel really bad about Angus and the guys and the ranch and the future. I'd been thinking about selling that ranch anyway. I was, I was actually going to offer it to Angus for a really good price. Maybe you and Brandon will want it. Well, after what that ranch has been through, maybe no one will want it. Jack, that's not true. You have one of the prettiest pieces of property in this valley. It'll take a little bit of time to clear the reputation, but in time, people forget all about it. I don't see how that's possible, Jack replied. Thanks for the coffee, Lynn. I've got everything out of the upstairs bedroom, and I really want to thank you again for letting me stay here. I'm glad you and Brandon are going to be gone for a few days. He got up, and he walked outside. He needed time to himself, time to think of a plan. Dakota rinsed with mouthwash to try to remove the taste of the vomit. He didn't have time to shower. He couldn't afford to lose his job for several reasons. His parole officer had helped him acquire it and paid the bills. Kept him out of trouble and kept him from more jail time. Charged with public intoxication, disorderly conduct, and simple assault on an officer of the law for pissing on his shoe, Landed Dakota in the drunk tank overnight in the county jail for another five days after that. He had come to the court appearance unshaven, hung over, and smelling like he hadn't showered or done his laundry in weeks. The judge had assigned him public service, and his parole officer had gotten him a job with the park service. Now, most days he knew he had a drinking problem, but by evening the problem became where he could get his next drink. At 22 years of age, nothing else much mattered. He'd attended high school in Whitefish, spent most of his weekends skiing in the winter and riding his mountain bike in the summer. His parents kicked him out of the house at 18, demanding that he get a job in an apartment. Well, he moved in with some friends in Cowspell for a short time and worked at a pizza joint. Then he'd been fired for coming into work drunk one too many times, and then his roommates had kicked him out for not paying his share of the rent. But then Steve, the parole officer, had taken a little pity on him and found him the job and helped him get the little studio apartment in Kalispell. He knew it was his last chance. If he screwed this up, he'd be crawling back to mom and dad or landing back in jail. He grabbed his park service hat, jumped in his old dark blue dented up Camry, and sped off for Glacier National Park Visitor Center, 43 minutes away. At the park entrance, Buck Brady was handed a map to all the scenic drives, visitor centers, the campgrounds, and the lakes and such, with a few days to kill before he could meet up with Cowboy Jim and make his border crossing. He decided to make his way across the park, visiting the various lakes and popular tourist spots. The cabin he had rented was at the far north part of the park, so he decided to drive there first, get settled in, and then go exploring. I feel like I'm on vacation. He laughed as he threw the map on the passenger seat next to his sandwich. Stopping at a particularly scenic overlook, he looked across at the panoramic view of the glacier-carved valleys, cascading waterfalls, and alpine meadows in the distance. He breathed in deeply. Hadn't felt so alive in a long time. Thought about how he was making a fresh start and how different life would be now that he had enough money to live the way he wanted to live for the rest of his life. It had all been worth it. All of it. Uh, several more miles down the road, he saw a dirt forest service road leading off into the trees. He decided to stop and stretch his legs and empty his bladder. He locked the truck and walked a short distance to a nearby tree. 
Peering through the trees to his left, something bright and sparkly caught his eye. A few more steps and he realized it was a ray of sunlight shining down through the trees and glinting off a small hidden lake. He walked back to his truck, made sure everything was well hidden out of sight, grabbed his pistol and his sandwich from the front seat and locked the doors. Stepping over branches and low bushes, he made his way towards the water. It would feel good to wash his face in a cold glacial lake, he thought, as he made his way towards the water's edge. Now, it was a small lake. It was surrounded by trees and just very little actual shoreline. Large, flat boulders halfway submerged in the water looked like a perfect spot to sit and soak in the sun for a few moments. He couldn't see any clearing through the trees, no sign of a road that led to this remote body of water. He sat down on a large rock and lifted his face to the sunlight, letting it warm his skin. It felt good to be Chase Whitmore once again. He'd been Buck Brady for far too many years now. He thought about Buck, about that day when they all decided to climb the rocks above the cave. He and Buck and Cliff all sitting up there on that rock, smoking a joint, encouraging each other to get up the nerve to jump. Buck had just found out his girl was pregnant, and he was half nervous, half excited at the prospect of becoming a dad. Suddenly, Buck got that crazy look in his eye, and he did it. He ran and he jumped, so they both followed. He didn't know about the shallows, well, not then anyway. They were just boys, acting out, having fun. Buck had to go and get himself killed. And then Cliff died, too. Using their names made him feel like they were both still alive. Still a part of him. He thought about the day they'd robbed the convenience store. How reckless they were after Buck's death. They didn't think about consequences back then. They were looking for adventure. Looking to fill that empty space that Buck's death had left in them both. But then Cliff had died when he wrecked the car. And when his uncle had come to get him out of jail, he didn't want to leave with him. He wanted to stay there, in that jail, till he rotted away to his death. It was Sheriff Parker's idea to step outside of himself, step away from the young man, Chase Whitmore, and become someone else. He thought it would help him lose his depression, take on a new identity, and make something of himself. See, his uncle had gotten him a job as a deputy, worked out whatever necessary paperwork to get it done, and in Deputy Buck Brady was a new man. There was no more Chase Whitmore. But then his uncle started getting sick and it didn't take long to convince his uncle to make him a sheriff, give him more responsibility. Sheriff Parker was working on an undisclosed secret investigation regarding cattle mutilations. Theories suggested everything from wolves to UFOs and aliens, but his uncle didn't believe the mutilations were caused by animals or something otherworldly. He noticed that all the cattle mutilations occurred just after cattle trucks had been at the ranch when the animals had been found. He discovered that the healthy cattle were being trucked away with sick and dying cows replacing them. The mutilated cows had their innards removed, their stomachs and intestines. It was not wolves killing these cows. It was the drugs they were carrying that ultimately killed them. These cows were being eviscerated to remove the drugs that had been inserted into their body cavities. After Parker's death, Buck Brady intended to continue the investigation until he realized how much money could be made if he was in on it. It had all run so smoothly until that damn Angus started getting suspicious and he ruined everything. The cattle mutilation story drew too much press, so the dead cattle had to be sold to processing plants turned into dog food instead. But then the USDA found the traces of drugs in the pet food. He sighed and removed his clothes, stepping into the lake diving under the surface. He leaned back on the rock, naked, letting the sun warm his body. It was making him sleepy. Maybe he'd close his eyes. Just for a few minutes, he thought to himself, as he drifted off to sleep. He didn't hear the heavily padded footsteps coming towards him through the trees. Once abundant throughout the American West, grizzly bears today live only in about five distinct recovery areas in the lower 48 states, sparsely inhabited areas of Canada. There are an estimated 300 grizzly bears in Glacier National Park. 
They are omnivores, and more than 90% of their diet consisting of grasses, roots, berries, pine nuts, mushrooms, insects, and larvae, while occasionally preying on larger animals. They normally avoid humans when possible. In July of 2023, a five-year-old female grizzly had to be euthanized when it became aggressive after being conditioned to eating food at a campground. Once a bear receives human food reward, it can become bold and aggressive in its attempt to, you know, to obtain more human food. But all bears can be dangerous when provoked or hungry. The young grizzly smelled the uneaten sandwich lying near the human's clothing, only a short distance from the man dozing on the rock. He cautiously took a step, waited and listened. He heard a strange noise coming from the man. But it was rhythmic, unthreatening. He took another step and paused. The man did not move. He took another step and another step, ready to dart back into the trees if he sensed danger. The smell of the pastrami on rye was making him drool. The man did not move. The smell of the food was beckoning him, him closer and closer. Now only a foot away from the sleeping man, he nuzzled the sandwich, grabbed it, and stepped back a few paces. Still, the man did not move. He wandered back looking for more, nuzzling the clothing, smelling the ground, the rock, the man. Buck Brady opened his eyes just in time to see the enormous furry bear sniffing his belly. He gasped. He yelled, and it startled the bear, who turned to run. But the bear's back foot slid down the rock, and the giant front paw came down on his chest, knocking the wind out of Buck. He raised his arm to push the beast off him at the same moment that giant teeth connected with his shoulder. The pain was immense. Buck screamed, but the frightened bear bit at his attacker, swiping a giant paw with long claws against Buck's face. The bear's back foot was lodged between two rocks, and his body twisted at an uncomfortable angle. In his pain and his fear, he bit and tore at the man pinned under him, until there were no more screams. The man lay motionless. Now there was no more threat, no more danger. With much effort, the bear dislodged his foot, and he limped away. You're late again. Dakota started in on his apologies and began to hang his park service jacket on the coat rack. Put it back on. I'm sending you out on the rounds today. I got paperwork to finish up. Take the pickup truck. Check all the points on the map just like we do every Monday after a busy weekend. And you damn sure better be back by four. Yes, sir. Dakota was glad to be doing the rounds alone this morning. His head still hurt and he appreciated the silence in his truck. Doing the rounds consisted of checking each scenic overlook, trailhead, and all the Forest Service roads in his segment of the park, making sure each vehicle was identified, properly showing their park pass tag. They made a note of the exact locations of each vehicle, just in case a hiker or a backpacker got lost, didn't return to their vehicle in an unexpected amount of time. He hadn't needed to call in search and rescue in the time he'd been involved with the Park Service, but his boss had told him several stories of hikers who'd gotten turned around and couldn't find their, their way back to their vehicle. Well, the truck on the Forest Service Road checked out. License plate registered to Chase Whitmore. He noted the location and was ready to turn his truck around when something in the distance caught his eye. He remembered that small hidden lake his supervisor had shown him the first time he'd done the rounds. Having not showered that morning, he decided it would be a good spot to take a break, have a quick swim, help clear his head. He locked his truck, headed towards a small, tranquil body of water. Dakota hadn't walked far when he thought he heard a rustling in the trees. Probably a deer, he thought to himself, as he continued on towards the water's edge, or the hiker whose truck was parked up there on the service road. The trees opened up, revealing a pristine lake with a glass-like surface. It was nearly noon, and the sun shone high overhead, glinting off the water. Well, he began to remove his boots and his park service uniform. Stepping into the cold water, he suddenly froze. 
Not a hundred yards away, a body lay half exposed behind a rock that jutted out into the water. The rock was red with blood. Jack and Miguel loaded the supplies into Miguel's truck and headed out to the ranch. Did Brandon say he'd heard anything in town? No. He asked a couple of people if they'd seen any strangers in town, you know, any unusual activity, but nothing so far. However, one of the deputies walked in while we were at the hardware store and asked Brandon if he'd seen the sheriff. Apparently, he didn't show up for work today. He didn't call in or anything. Now, the deputy called him a couple of times, but the calls just go to a voicemail. He said the sheriff's truck is parked outside his house, but he didn't answer the door. Well, now that sounds suspicious. We need to keep a lookout for him anyway, Jack answered. Miguel nodded. Yeah, him, the feds, the narcos. We got a lot to keep an eye out for. Well, I figure we got a day to set up. We'll build a blind up on that ridge, someplace hidden where we can look down and watch the ranch. We'll see anyone coming from a long ways off. I've got a tent. I've got some camping equipment in the barn. We'll set that up and we'll just see what happens. I'm sure glad you're here, Miguel. And Miguel nodded. Me too. I wish there were more of us, though. We, we sure could use Julian here with us. The body of a naked man was lying half exposed between a large flat rock with a smaller boulder wedged against it. Bloody paw prints stood out against the gray granite color of the rock. The man was dead. Gaping red marks where his face and neck had been slashed from the razor claws of the bear. Dakota turned his head and threw up for the second time that day. Realizing he'd left his radio in the truck, he turned and walked towards the man clothes, checking the pockets for identification or keys to the man's truck. A pistol was lying on the ground underneath the man's pants. There was no wallet. He probably left it in the truck. He found the man's keys in the front pocket of the pants and he quickly walked back to the vehicle. He knew he should radio his supervisor immediately, but first he thought he'd check out the man's truck for his wallet. It would be important to tell his boss a man's name, he supposed. He'd never had training on how to handle a situation like this. Searching the man's truck, he found the wallet tucked underneath the front seat, along with more guns. The driver's license identified the man as a Chase Whitmore. He knew he probably shouldn't do it, but he looked under the blanket in the back seat at the man's duffel bags. Clothes, tools, guns, and what the hell? Bags of white powder. A duffel full of crisp $100 bills. More money than he could possibly imagine. Dakota stood dumbfounded, looking at the bags spread out before him. Something inside him. A thin voice of reason told him to zip up the bag, put him back under the blanket in the back seat, and call it in. But it was a tiny voice of reason. A much bigger voice said, This is your chance. This is your ticket out of here. No one knew about the body. No one knew what was in this truck. No one except Dakota. He thought about the dead body, the blood on the rocks. Now, he could make the body disappear into the lake, but how? The blood on the rocks would wash away, right? And then there was the issue of the truck. But then no one knew about it but him. He decided to drive the truck farther up the dirt road, hide it in a better location, and come back for it later. Worried that another park ranger might find the truck, he decided to take the duffels out and hide them as well. He found a nice hollow tree trunk to stash the bags and covered the opening with branches. Now he'd have to do something with the body. He grabbed a rope from the Forest Service truck and walking back to the lake, he found a large boulder, almost too heavy to lift. He tied the rope around the rock and tied the man's torso to it. With much effort, he rolled the rock and the man into the water. Using the man's clothing, he rubbed as much of the blood off of the rock that he could. And satisfied that he'd removed all signs of the struggle, he returned to his park service truck and continued on with his rounds, daydreaming about the lucky turn of events and what all that money would buy him. He couldn't wait for the end of his shift. He'd return to work with the park truck, finish his reports for the day, 
get in his little Camry and head back to Forest Service Road to the hidden truck. By the time anyone found his little dark car hidden in the forest, he'd be long gone on his way to Mexico. Too risky trying to cross into Canada, but by the time he'd reached the opposite border, he'd have most of the cocaine sold. Dakota cranked up the radio, singing along to the Zach Brown song that seemed particularly appropriate. I got my toes in the water, my ass in the sand. Not a worry in the world, cold beer in my hand. Life is good today. Life is good today. <laughs>